Uh, hi everyone, this is Said again. I'm very happy and excited to be with Dr. Ilan Shahin today. We're going to talk about the issue of tech adoption, technology adoption amongst primary care physicians. So Dr. Shahin is a, is a ER physician. He is a technology enthusiast. He's an MBA and he is the co-founder of Consult Loop. Uh, and so Dr. Shahin, can you please introduce yourself? Sure, so thanks for having me on here, Said. So that pretty much sums it up. Uh, my clinical work is a mix of family practice and emergency room work outside of Toronto in a town mm -hmm. called Simcoe. Mm -hmm. uh, additionally, I spend uh, a lot of my time uh, developing a health technology platform to help patients. Uh, that's Consult Loop. It's an e-referral platform. Uh, maybe you know we can uh, touch upon what some of the experience has been like over this discussion. Mm -hmm. But uh, in a way, I think health technology has always been something that I'm interested in. I've been involved in various ways uh, through various parts of my career, but uh, you know, Consult Loop is definitely the big, um, big foray into improving things for patients through technology mm -hmm. uh, beyond what I could do as a clinician. So uh, I I know that you have an MBA as well, and uh, and I see I, I've seen a lot of like uh, not a lot of doctors, but there are quite a few doctors who pursue another stream uh, beside their practice. So it means that that the community of uh, physicians they do realize that that the work that they do is a little bit more holistic. So they have to have an understanding of other aspects of 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 science, quite frankly, to be able to be uh, uh, very good at what they do, which is helping people to feel better and to get better in in, in wide range of like uh, practices that they're that they're active in. Uh, so, but what I'm very curious about, what in particular was it the more like uh, the business side, or more was it more on the quality of care side? Was it more on uh, on the vision side? What actually got you very intrigued? At like a technology enthusiast before you became a physician or you just felt a need to uh, to to get into the technology world? Sure. So, I mean, I was always interested in technology mm -hmm. uh, growing up. I wouldn't say I was a big programmer, <laughs> but uh, you know, I used to make websites on the side, you know, uh, in college days and at the end of high school, early part of university. Um, mm -hmm. And actually, one of the things that I did in university is take a Java class, and I think that really opened my mind to the level of sophistication and power of what computing could do. I would say, though, that the uh, experience of the MBA uh, comes first before the technology. And really, for the MBA, it was about management more than business. Mm -hmm. um, I really saw, like, in the clinical work, is that there's a responsibility as a physician within a profession, and therefore a professional responsibility, to really take care of how we're interfacing with patients, how we're interfacing with the public, and not just the ones that are patients under our care. Mm -hmm. so there are a lot of implications from uh, safety and ethics, but as well from a matter of efficiency, and not in a cold way of efficiency, but as in if we're trying to improve our care by this increment, by this level of patient-centeredness, by this mm -hmm. level of um, uh, pleasantness of, of being through the healthcare journey, how can we do that? And mm -hmm. I think it's important to become effective in that. Mm -hmm. Now, whether one doctor doing an MBA does that uh, or not, I would say the answer is no. Really, yeah. it takes a culture shift. But I mm -hmm. think um, going through the MBA concurrently with the medicine uh, brought in my mind a little bit my approach to medicine, and I think mm -hmm. it allowed me to interact with a lot, a lot of other healthcare practitioners, be they, be they nurses, doctors, um, who are also pursuing management. And really, I think they were... Um, taken by the same spirit, that we could do things in a better way for patients who know how to make change, know how to manage change, know what to measure, and really learn from other industries that have done a very good job, and in some cases haven't, but mm -hmm. uh, that's still experience that we can take to improve, which is ultimately, I think, what we all want to do. So with that in mind, um, I think today, technology is the way that we do a lot of this. I think when I did my MBA, this was before cloud computing. This was before um, the kind of sharing economy that we have, Uber, Airbnb, and that model of a business, which is one that I'm in right now. Um, but like being, being aware of the language, being aware of the questions that you should ask, and the way that you should critically appraise the surroundings that you're in, I think is uh, what was valuable about the MBA. Mm -hmm. um, now with technology, it's simply a means to achieve the same ends, which is really improving things by the way that they're delivered and the way that they're structured. The entire reason that you got into the field of technology and, and also like what is this to 
boost the experience of the patient through the healthcare journey, make things a little bit more efficient. Uh, and we, I think there's no debate right now that use of technology uh, typically uh, leads to better patient outcomes in general, and also, of course, better economical outcomes uh, for the most part, uh, although like I have a, quite, quite a few of examples of, of, uh, of other researchers that, that doesn't show any significant uh, correlation, but in general, use of technology make things more accessible for the patient, for the consumer of healthcare, and and also like uh, leads to better economical outcomes. But and Canada as a country, I think, has every reason to move towards technology. We are a vast country. We are very ourselves, very tech savvy. Uh, uh, but I think there is a little bit of uh, pushback. Uh, or, or for lack of better word, or, or not like a high adoption amongst like healthcare as a whole, and and primary care physicians in a specific, because you guys are the front line of our healthcare. So if you do not adopt technology, we can't really claim that that our healthcare has adopted that technology. So, uh, what are the things that comes to your mind uh, uh, when when thinking about that statement? That for yourself as as a physician, it makes sense economically. It makes sense from a care delivery perspective. It makes sense from every other perspective. So uh, we are going to dig a little bit about this this issue. But what is the first thing that comes to your mind? I think the there has to be a little bit of a vision as to what we're trying to accomplish mm -hmm. and how we're trying to do that. So. For instance, when it comes to, let's say, uh, telemedicine, that's another platform because we're addressing barriers to access, for one. Um, in some cases, you could say we're going to scale the ability of one clinician to provide care to multiple people, and that might be looking at something like the Omada Health Platform, where you have a health coach for many different groups, and now you've scaled that clinician. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think the problem is at the primary care level, uh, we're not looking at the healthcare system as a whole when we ourselves are clinicians looking after our own patients, looking after our own clinic. So we sometimes fail to make those kinds of connections. Um, so, you know, some of the barriers really ultimately come down to the system. And I think we're dealing with environments that are that are based on EMR, everything is built on. Uh, additionally, I mean, from a financial perspective, uh, you can't really bill for it. It's a billable act under OHIP. Uh, that becomes a bit of a barrier as well. Um, but I think patients are starting to see from, from their other experience in other sectors what's possible, and they're starting to wonder why can't things be this way in healthcare. Uh, I think we're starting to feel that as primary care physicians because we're interacting with patients so much, but I think it's a little bit different than maybe some of the hospital or specialty space where a department or a hospital with a budget of hundreds of millions of dollars um, can maybe find a pocket for a few hundred thousand dollars for very advanced technology. I think for primary care, there are some financial constraints and there's some things that are beyond the clinic that needs to be done kind of at a, at a larger, more system level, just at a bigger scale. Ultimately, though, it comes down to what we're trying to achieve. And technology can offer a lot of benefits um, and a lot of patient benefits that, you know, we talk about patient empowerment, but I think it needs to be a little bit more specific. What are we trying to achieve? How can we measure that or not? Uh, what would be a good outcome or not? And, uh, and do we have the infrastructure to do this properly? Um, there are really a lot of considerations. It's a very complex problem. But, uh, but I think the vision is where everything needs to stand articulated uh, with specifics. So you mentioned quite a few points, and of course, there is not one reason stopping primary care physicians of adopting technology. Uh, but you mentioned also a very interesting point that primary care physicians sometimes lack uh, the 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 full image of our healthcare. Do you think you being a, an ER physician uh, also played a role in in you getting like a bit more? Providing technology for your peers uh, and like being ambitious to to uh, ba basically make a change in how things happen in our healthcare system. Yeah, I think uh, I think it helps. So, so to be honest with you, the, the development of Consult Loop and my working in the ER kind of happened concurrently. But mm -hmm. basically, I was taken away from my regular clinical context and put in the system from two different angles. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very valuable experience, and I think. Uh, interact with a lot of the environments and mixing mm -hmm. up their week. I think by doing that, you gain a little bit um, possibilities of uh, what solutions are out there a little bit better. But 
I think for healthcare, there's something very important, which is that in as we try and optimize our own processes, sometimes we create externalities and throw things onto the other mm-hmm. side. So if I try and, let's say, make things a little bit more efficient for myself as a family doctor, and, and in a way it comes down to cutting corners sometimes, <laughs> that spills over to other other members. Uh, yeah. You know, if I, if I may not add all the details around a patient, that makes it much more difficult for the specialist. And something that could take me a minute would take then, you know, uh, 15 minutes of someone's time to rectify. Mm-hmm. So I think it's very important as, as physicians and non-physicians alike, but anyone working in healthcare, to be in some different environments. And I think it creates a little bit of empathy, empathy for other players in the system. Um, and that creates the drive to find improvement. And I think it also provides the, uh, the kind of fertile ground for coming up with some solutions mm-hmm. and finding the path to be implemented. Fantastic. Uh- and uh, I do, through your uh, the answer you provided to my other question, you mentioned like billing, you mentioned the system barriers, you mentioned a lot of like reasons which are all valid and we'll get to. But the first thing that came to my mind when I realized that the technology adoption is is so low amongst the primary care physicians was this question: maybe just simply there is not enough good technologies for them to use. To be very honest with you, when I got to know how the EMR looks like, uh, the, <laughs> I was like, "It's you guys are actually being very patient because that like that whole system is 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 not really like uh, user friendly." <laughs> so, is that is there is there, is there any merit to what I just said? And if so, what are the causes uh, of uh, that are like behind? behind this issue like do you think there is a lack of communication between the tech enthusiasts tech technology leaders and primary care physicians or like they, they don't get along what is the the, the underlying issue well uh, I, don't, I don't know if this is a it's maybe gonna be a bit of a hot take but I think <laughs> for the EMRs there are definitely some people that are using them very very effectively mm-hmm. and in fact there are a couple of physicians in London specifically uh, Name names Mario Elia and Kathy Foltz, who use EMRs in very powerful ways, um, both for quality improvement within their own clinics in terms of patient safety and, and, and uh, creating pathways for follow up. And uh, Dr. Adam Stewart is another another doc um, as well who, who provides a lot of leadership in that area. So I mean, we could look at docs like that and say they're making tremendous use out of their EMRs. Mm-hmm. This is fantastic. I think there's two problems. One is that for most physicians. Their, their ability to use the EMR for advanced um, uh, advanced functionalities is fairly limited. Mm-hmm. Uh, so while the technology may be capable of doing certain things, it's not really uh, having very good penetrance into the marketplace, which is physicians. So it's great to have the bells and whistles, but if they're not being used, that's not that great. So that's a, that's a user experience issue and, and uh, maybe a design issue. I think... Another issue is that it's one thing to use the EMR for the operations in your own clinic. So I could record things on my patients, I could do some QI on, on um, some metrics within my own patient population. But there's some things that could be a little bit uh, a little bit better if it, if it interacts with other clinics. So that's because mm-hmm. of the interconnectivity. Yes. And I think at this point there's a bit of an issue when it comes to the policies as well as maybe some of the funding models where we're not... We haven't put enough pressure on the various EMRs to communicate together. Mm-hmm. And maybe where the pressure has been there, privacy regulations are fairly strict that put kind of uh, privacy and privacy risks above functionalities. Mm-hmm. I think that's been tolerable maybe for some period of time. But for instance, in the last couple of months, it's come to the attention through the media that the opioid crisis is a big problem, uh, which it has been for some time. But we're looking at other problems. Prescription registries where a physician could see what's been prescribed elsewhere and perhaps not prescribe a medication that would be used to potentially kill a patient because people are really literally dying from this. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that has raised some interest in um, in our various technology platforms, speaking between clinics and speaking between hospitals and basically being a bit more province-wide. So, so, you know, EMRs definitely have their limitations, but some of them are very powerful to their credit. I think the problem is that it's not in a very, like their power is not easily accessible to the garden variety physician, mm-hmm. may not be very tech able, and that the power could be 
a whole level of magnitude further if it could be interacting with other clinics and um, and other other health providers in let's say that physicians community uh, both in terms of the functionality aspect like the opioid registry I mentioned but also in terms of the data because all improvement starts with data and frankly we don't have enough good data here in Ontario. Yes, uh, so uh, you mentioned like uh, uh, privacy uh, and the fact that sometimes we uh, we uh, sacrifice functionality. Uh, we tend to sacrifice con functionality because of privacy risks, and that's something that as as a as a as someone who is in the field of technology and health tech, we've uh, uh, experienced to some extent. I wouldn't say it's a barrier uh, like the privacy, uh, but what the the problem I felt and we felt as as a technology company uh, was that. Like the the main regulation, PHIPA or Personal Health Information Act, that governs anything around personal health information, is a little bit outdated. To be very honest with you, in terms of their language, and it's up for uh, interpretation <laughs> for a lot of times. So it's really depending uh, depends on how uh, sometimes, unfortunately, on how much you are willing to take risk. And and I know uh, physicians being part of the public system uh, and. and like anything like that has to do with public system is very like risk free, very like trying to mitigate the, the, any amount of risk that's out there. Uh, so that's that's a very interesting topic uh, that 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 I'd like to to chat with you about. But uh, uh, do you like see any any other bear? Because I know like all the doctors are tech savvy. They do have like their. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, they're on everywhere. They're very up to speed with internet. They're up to speed with technologies. They all have Fitbits, Apple Watches. I've seen, <laughs> I've seen they're actually like amongst the savviest people, uh, 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 demography of, of professionals that we have in Canada. Uh, but there's not too many uh, softwares beyond EMR that, that can incorporate into their practice. Uh, what do you think is the reason for that? Yeah, I think, uh, I think, there's a couple of reasons. So one is around the workflows, whereas the technology really has to be built with the office's processes in mind. Mm -hmm. So if it's too disruptive, um, and really the tolerance for disruption is very, very, very low. Mm -hmm. um, if it's too disruptive, and that speaks to the physician, as well as the physician assistant, as well as the nurses, as well as the administrative staff, as well as even the patients themselves, uh, if it's too disruptive for any one party, then it really doesn't go forward. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that I think every health technology company comes up against at some point. They really need to understand their user base and how they work. And, and as well, mm -hmm. they may not be able to find something that fits everybody. Yes. So I think that's one problem. I think another problem is that very often when physicians are trying to evaluate a new technology, which on the face of it seems very simple, like let's say uh, booking appointments with patients or emailing with their patients to let them know about results or calling them back to make word to come from another industry. When they're evaluating this, they're trying to understand what they're allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do, and they're trying to get their guidance from the college, which is typically going to be fairly risk averse, which mm -hmm. is its role. Um, but you know, when in doubt, don't engage. I yeah. guess that's kind of the way that they uh, look at it. Which is, which is fairly appropriate, but I think if we're trying to take all these types of technologies and put them in the hands of physicians and their clinics and therefore impact the patient's experience, then we have to be giving a green light or at least a green light with caution just to say, here are the parameters where it would be safe, uh, or these are some companies that we've looked at their processes, and I, and I know that... Um, uh, it's a big undertaking. We've looked at their processes and we're able to kind of endorse them within a marketplace for physicians. Mm -hmm. uh, I think doing something like a privacy impact assessment, which which can be fairly uh, you know complex and involved, is a good place to start. But uh, I think for physicians, they would just want something very simple to say that, okay, this is all right. Other <laughs> docs are using it. This is how it implemented in my practice. It's not disruptive and it doesn't take on a big risk. Um, the technologies that are out there are being used in other sectors. Um, they can have a very big impact for patients. It can make lives for doctors easier if it fits their workflows, for sure. But I think the mental energy to kind of take on that risk and understand should I do it or not do it, mm -hmm. getting all the stakeholders on board is sometimes a barrier. I think we need to simplify that and make it easier for, for 
uh, innovative solutions to kind of uh, infuse themselves through our healthcare system. We're just not doing that. Great. Uh, so let's move to the next uh, topic that you brought up, which is very important, and it's the billing code. Complex document. <laughs> I've uh, got the chance to have a look at it, uh, uh, like small sections of it, uh, and it doesn't really like recognize uh, a lot of uh, methods of delivery of care. Uh, namely like home monitoring and there's a lot of debate around it i fully understand it or like virtual visits uh, and in a way it's not really uh basically uh incentivizing uh the doctors to to actually adopt new technologies and i think one way or another uh like we have to as you mentioned like technology makes things a bit more efficient so i think it's in the best interest of everyone to move into the direction to to really uh, acknowledge that the change of uh, how things happen like uh, we can we cannot we can very well establish a, a, a relationship we can very well deliver some like limited uh, spectrum of care without being in the same room uh, and and I think like we have to like take the, the same uh, the, the next step to to recognize this change and how things are happening in general and world right so, so I'd like to invite you to make a comment about it. Sure. So I totally agree with you. I think, um, you know, the billing code structure is fairly difficult because it comes through negotiations with the government, which, uh, which has its own pace, let's say, its own cycle <laughs> of renewal. Um, so in a way, like, you know, there haven't been significant changes as far as uh, paying for different models of healthcare delivery in years, if ever. Um, but you could look at, let's say, what the last four years have been like from a technological standpoint, how costs have come down, uh, and how possible it is to provide care virtually. And I think uh, what you guys are doing is a perfect example of that. I think there needs to be a way for the billing code uh, to change and react and, and adapt itself really quickly with the pace of technology. Mm -hmm. It has to match the speed of the technology that is meant to support. Mm -hmm. I think the other problem is that the billing codes really aren't designed right now to incentivize the right thing. So uh, as far as, let's say, fee-for-service billing codes go, sure, you're incentivizing youth. I wouldn't say incentivizing youth. You're actually like, rewarding youth, which is, which is good. Um, but, uh, but in a way, you're not really incentivizing people to rethink how they're doing things. So I look at my own family practice. I'm a fee-for-service physician in that way. But it would make more sense. I think it would be better uh, if I'm able to interact with patients by email, quickly explain something by video if need be over a two-minute chat. It saves the patients tons of time, and it, it uh, liberates me as a physician to be able to book in a couple of hours in different places during the week uh, mm -hmm. without having to go and commit to you know six hours in the clinic on that day, uh, for instance. The thing is, there's absolutely no incentive for me to do that, and in mm -hmm. fact, it's it's entirely disincentivized and coming out of my pocket. And in, in some cases, that's become a little bit difficult with patients. And I find as, as someone who is a little bit more technologically advanced, sometimes it's a bit embarrassing um, to find that I'm thinking about you know calling the patient, but then that's less of a visit, and I really shouldn't be thinking about that. That's just a distraction and takes away from good medicine. So, I mean, the billing code is very complex. It does create some questions around incentives from a behavioral standpoint, mm -hmm. uh, and you keep up with the technology. I mean, there's there's um, there's a lot of new ways to deliver care to patients, uh, and I think as technology, especially cloud computing, is coming on, we're going to have to keep pace with that. And I think something you mentioned before, which is that Canada is kind of a perfect environment for adopting technology in healthcare because the infrastructure exists, because almost everyone has a smartphone. We have to be taking advantage of that. And if you're to be restructuring the billing codes from the beginning, you're going to probably say that we have to be encouraging people to um, to try new things, to try and do things in a more patient-centric way, and we have to be able to adapt fairly quickly, where if something's not working, we could change the billing code, and if something new has emerged and we want to support our physicians to be engaging with patients, we'll be able to do that. Really, the kind of uh, R&D component of the billing codes is not there, and that's very unfortunate, because uh, one, it could help uh, diffusion of new technologies, which is good from uh, the standpoint of our system, but it 
pulls uh, it pulls the patient's experience away from where it could be, given what's out there. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to actually play the, the devil's advocate's role. So I was I came across a, I have a passion for health economics. Uh, I came across a paper uh, that was uh, uh, done I think in the UK if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so they. It was a randomized control like error uh, paper. Uh, they actually studied a, a group of patients that were assigned uh, uh, with a device, a home monitoring device under blood pressure. So I, as someone who is, of course, very, very passionate about technology, about uh, like, uh, making it easier, access, more accessible, giving the patient like the, the authority, some sort of control over their care journey, I, I, uh, I'm an advocate for, for home care as well, like home monitoring. Like I, I, I think it makes sense. I think it's great. Uh, but actually, the study found that there, there were, like the, the emergency room visits actually was sparked up after, after they, give, they gave those devices to those patients very well. And they would like, like if they're, like, they couldn't really read the number and like the device says, because they almost wanted someone to tell them you're okay. Right, so 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 they would see a rise in their blood pressure, and they would oh, I should I should go to emergency room. I'm about to die. So that and so, what do you think about about that? Like uh, about like when you're giving uh, like more access to patients to to be a little bit more in charge of their care, which is an uh, an uh, not unwanted, but but a consequence of using technology one way or another. Uh, what do you think about about that? About what is where is the fine line? So it's, it's a great question. I think that example, uh, it, it's the kind of thing where if you were to run this trial, um, and then you find yes, there's an increase in ER use, you probably iterate and say we need to educate the patients about when is appropriate, when is not appropriate, or we might take something very simple like like uh, like messaging with with a healthcare provider where they could simply ask a question like, hey, is the blood pressure of 160 over 100 a problem? And they might say, well, uh, you know, do you have X, Y, Z? How long has it been there for? Why don't you check it again in half an hour and let me know? And then you can save an emergency visit. So mm -hmm. I, I think when you hear that and say it's a failure, um, like when the study concludes that it's a failure, it's really jumping the gun. There's something to be learned there and we could maybe iterate a little bit, find what the problem is, and there could be um, some advantage that we are throwing out with the whole process of saying this home monitoring is no good. Mm -hmm. So I think in this case, maybe it didn't do well because we're over testing, there's too much information, and you're kind of being compelled to act on it. And I think in medicine in general, we're pulling away from screening um, because we're finding that there's over harm and overuse. And you see the change a lot of the testing that we used to consider routine uh, but has been shown to have no benefit and if anything harms from overuse. But I think this, this runs across uh, that problem. Um, but I think the other problem has to do with the kind of me measures that we put um, new technologies up against, which is the randomized control trial. I think this is a very huge mistake. Mm -hmm. The randomized control trial is really for drug trials and it says, are we finding a statistical significance in, in uh, a very small set of measures or not? I think the statistical significance when it comes to something like this, which has a strong experiential quality, qualitative component, mm -hmm. is wrong. Uh, the patients may have had an increased use of ER visits, and maybe through this, through this, um, in this short time period, there was an increased use of ER visits, but that became an educational uh, moment for the patients, mm -hmm. and then they took their blood pressure more seriously, and maybe there were less cardiovascular events after the fact. Randomized yeah. control trial will not pick that up. The other thing is that if through something like this, you're now reviewing the data and you say, I know what we should do. We should take a intercom and put a, a healthcare provider on the other side of it um, who in the middle of their day can maybe quickly answer a couple of messages. And now we're supporting the patients in a much better way. Access to care is better. Uh, it doesn't cost very much in terms of staffing and the technology of adding something like intercom is basically nothing. So yes. for the privacy concerns, <laughs> I know those are there. Um, by iterating, the, study, the results from the randomized control trial are now basically obsolete. So it's really not fair, especially when you can be agile with technology to measure something mm -hmm. with the randomized control trial. I don't think we would do that in our own businesses to say, oh no, this thing didn't work, so we're going to shut it down. Like We're not saying that. We're saying, okay, we're going to iterate, we're going to learn, we're going to get better. 
the randomized control trial really eliminates that attitude from the table. And that, that attitude, that tenacious attitude of finding improvement and making things better and being creative and trying again, that attitude is what we need in healthcare. And with the randomized control trial, we really shut it out of the conversation and that's to the detriment of patients. We really have to get away from when it comes to experiences like this and measuring whether they're good or not. So yeah, you mentioned uh, you mentioned a very good point, which is which is the the education piece. And of course, I think if any piece of technology or any piece of anything that related to healthcare is given to the patient, uh, there should be education around it. And it's education is hard, of course. Like people uh, get bored going through any type of tutorial, <laughs> and 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 that brings a a very interesting point around the usability of the technologies that are we are giving to the patients. Uh, but uh, can you talk to me a little bit about the, the importance of primary care physicians themselves? Do you, is there a, a good mechanism for the docs to know uh, about, uh, or a universal mechanism that for the doctors to know, okay, these are the new technologies, uh, uh, the, like, they're really around it, and they can get a debate going in a way? Sure. Uh, I think there are some, but it's definitely lacking. So I think in mm -hmm. Ontario, um, specifically Ontario MD has taken some good leadership in this mm -hmm. situation where uh, they have, let's say, the Every Step Conference. Mm -hmm. um, it started off as a way to showcase the EMRs. Now, maybe it's a little bit critical, but although they have other technology groups that are there as exhibitors, I think at the end of the day, the EMRs are still the focus. Uh, and I think, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah we are. So I think, you know, that's a great start because, you know, companies like yours and companies like ours really should be there. Um, the EMRs are already fairly established. I think as a doctor, if you're not taking an yeah. EMR on by now, then forget about it. And every step is doing a good job in terms of getting docs to use your EMR in more powerful ways, but it's also become a bit of a vehicle for, for doctors to find out about new technologies. Mm -hmm. Um, exhibiting at other conferences that are unrelated to technology just happen to be there. Uh, has been a way to get uh, conversations going, but I don't think it's as structured and as formal as EMR adoption was, where there was very heavy subsidies by the government, a very strong push in terms of uh, visits to physicians about how they could uh, uh, reimagine their practice in EMRs. Mm -hmm. um, I think now that the second waves of technologies have come, we need to be doing that, and really aside from what Ontario MD is doing, I'm not seeing a lot of leadership there. Uh, I think that speaks about education on the physician side as to what's out there. At the same time, you mentioned something about patients. I think it's very hard to market to patients um, because really at the end of the day, everything goes to their family doctor's office. Maybe for something like you where they could interact with your services directly, there's an opportunity there and I'm sure that there's a very strong demand because I hear about it in my practice all the time. Mm -hmm. um, but for some other technologies like ours where it speaks to referrals and wait time navigation and being notified about appointments, the patient has to be connected to their family doctor's office who's taking on this technology. With anything new that you do, especially something that changes processes, you really can't take shortcuts in terms of making sure that everyone who interacts with that process is aware of the change and is aware of what their new role is in that way, how it fits with the ultimate goal, which is, a, which is providing good quality care. Um, I think, let's say from our own experience, there's been uh, some variance in terms of the success of implementation and some we've had to put a lot more effort into onboarding and some we've had to put less. And really what it comes down to is the clinic's commitment to say, all right, we're gonna be doing this right, let's get everyone around the table, and our most successful clinics have been very proactive in terms of educating the patient once they leave the office, what happens next? Mm -hmm. What's the physician's role with that patient's engagement with that technology mm -hmm. afterwards? And in some cases, um, they've even printed up uh, like kind of these, these papers that they hand out to the patients or some have made sure that the patients are coming by to speak to someone to explain what's happening. Um, and that kind of upfront investment of time and education has paid some dividends down the line. I think we make a mistake if we expect technology just to be purchased and that then it will then work. And I think maybe EMRs in some way um, have, have gone through that story. They've been purchased, but they're not really used to the best of their ability. And it requires a little bit of investment up front to make sure that everyone is fully aware as to what the possibilities are and how they can make benefit of that. And so, in a way, this, the, the leadership that we need from a central standpoint is to understand what technologies are out there, what they could do, and what can be adopted. Mm -hmm. 
I think that incorporates some incentives and subsidies, uh, much like EMRs have benefited from. And then the second piece is, how can we make it really easy to be taken on in the clinical space? And that involves making it very easy to explain things to patients, um, to make educational modules and onboarding modules without making, I know that sounds very cumbersome, but it doesn't have to be, um, but making it very easy for the technology to be diffused uh, through the healthcare system and the clinical spaces that they'll be used. Um, so I know we use the word education uh, in both cases. The spirit of it is a little bit different, but I think at the end of the day, it's taking the time to understand how will this change uh, what I'm doing, how will this improve it, and how can I make this happen in the best way by investing upfront in attention for benefits in the long run. Involved in the health consumer business uh, myself, I, I can talk forever about uh, about the challenges or. or uh, that that comes with building a health consumer product. Uh, the it's it's wonderful uh, like going through the, the the process of understanding what happens to that like unit or that patient that uh, client that, that is is interacting with healthcare. What goes in their mind uh, when they're experiencing that uh, a distress of of any sort and uh, the goals that they have in mind and and how we can really help them to to walk through the process, but uh, which can be like a full like a topic of another conversation as you are like in the, in the same similar business basically, uh, health technology, but on the, on the physician side. And of course, like someone has to use it as well. So like there's a lot of usability that comes with your platform as well. But uh, I'd like to uh, end this interview with a question. Uh, so a lot of doctors are primary care physician of delivery of care some see themselves as more of a of a of a manager of of uh, the client of patients conditions in a way to like basically be the vehicle for referrals like follow ups making sure that the patient get the, the gets the care that they want and they, they deserve uh, i think more use of technology would make a, a family doctors and primary care physicians more of a manager uh, or like the frontliner that basically like gets the pages them as opposed to the vehicle of delivery of care. Do you think uh, there is a little bit of like th does that think like a mind does that thought uh, brings uh, uh, does is that thought unsettling a little bit to you? What do you think about it? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I actually think about that a lot. Um, so for me, one of the things that I think about is if we had to redesign how family practice is run, how primary care is run, what mm -hmm. would it look like? And I suspect it would look very different. And in a way, it would look similar to part of what I do, and that with a little bit of uh, thought as to what the journey is like, not just for the patient, but for all the players involved and the information flow, there could be more of a managerial role, and basically I scale my capacity. So instead of caring for the number of patients that I do, I could maybe build something for a pathway for, let's say, uh, diabetes or, or um, you know, patients that are maybe on anticoagulants or patients with hypothyroidism. Um, you could build these kinds of pathways and then care for, if you're doing it for 10 or 20, well, then why not do it for hundreds at that point? I think... What you spoke about as well is very interesting, which is that as someone doing you know, direct-to-consumer health stuff, you get the pleasure and the frustration of thinking <laughs> through the whole journey, and at the same time, there's a, there's a, uh, a wealth of things you have to be dealing with. Yeah. I think it is a bit unsettling because there's a lot of ways that my job could change. If I were to take a step back and, let's say, with 20 other doctors, say, how can we look after 100,000 patients um, in a bit of a better way, in a way that we scale up our knowledge. I think it would change a lot, but it would be a lot less face-to-face -face time, which is really what we're trained for uh, throughout medical school. But I think if we take a step back, what we're really trained for is looking after the community and the population that we're in. And mm -hmm. if that means maybe finding other ways to counsel them about exercise and getting them access to healthy food, um, then that's really better than me sitting with them for 20 minutes and talking about healthy eating and talking about exercise if at the end of the day what they need is a program that puts them in, uh, in community-based uh, programming around uh, healthy lifestyles. Mm -hmm. I think we need to think outside of the box and beyond just the, the physician-patient interaction in the clinic. I think I would be okay with that changing, but I think what I would not be okay with is 
turning away from that priority of patient care coming first and community care coming first. Mm -hmm. I think public health is a sector that maybe has been uh, left outside of this conversation with clinicians, and we need to maybe bridge with some of what they're doing, because at the end of the day, we're all looking after doing the same thing. I think we can rethink our rules if we understand that we need to scale our knowledge beyond the one-to-one -one interaction in a room. And I think we're at a time where technology is, is at such a pace of acceleration in terms of both what it could do and how it could diffuse throughout our society that now is a really exciting time to be reconsidering these questions. And I mean, not to, uh, not to toot your horn too much, but I think what you guys are doing as a way of getting patients in front of clinicians and overcoming a lot of access to care and overcoming a lot of kind of uh, like barriers of this this patient belongs to this group, this one belongs to another one, and they use the differential in terms of the access there. I think you've blown through a lot of that, and it's a very good example of how technology and positioning something in a certain way could fix a lot of problems that we face. Um, now is a great time to be thinking about it, and I think about it all the time. There's a few people I talk to about it, you being one of them, and some, <laughs> some close physician friends. But I think it's a conversation that needs to happen at a provincial level with patient advocates, with physician groups, be they specialist, hospital-based, community-based, rural, where there's a huge mm -hmm. opportunity for improvement, and, uh, and definitely indigenous uh, uh, healthcare providers, uh, where there's, where there's uh, I think, huge problems that we really need to be solving as a question of uh, national importance. Uh, this is a conversation that we really need to be having in a very open public square with a lot of input and I think we need to do some of the hard things that we've been putting off for a long time because now the possibilities to improve them are too mm -hmm. hard to ignore. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Shine. It was such a pleasure. Uh, thanks, thanks so much. Yeah, this is, this is great. I, uh, you know, I've uh, had a great time chatting with you about this, both uh, person and mm -hmm. uh, you know, I really like to see where things go in the next few years because the potential is tremendous and mm -hmm. um, and I hope even half of what can pan out does because it will change a lot both for the providers that are providing care and the patients that are on the other side experiencing it. So thanks for having me. Thank you.